So what we're going to talk about today is um, landscaping with native plants, a little bit about why you want to use native plants in your landscape, and then we're going to go through some of the plants that we like and talk about um, how they perform in the garden. So does it matter? Um, I'll make a little bit of a case here for using native plants and biodiversity and trying to restore ecosystems. Um, deforestation and agriculture intensification and land use changes have really put a stress on insects and birds. Both insect and bird populations are way down. Um, there's a lot of urban sprawl where people plant just green lawns and monocultures and non-native plants. Um, and, and even in rural areas like I live in, a lot of the um, native species are really rather hard to find. It's, it's still a lot of monoculture. So 96% of the North American birds will rear their young on insects. And then 69% of the caterpillar species have evolved to develop on only one plant family. So to keep a lot of caterpillars out there and a lot of diversity, uh, well, to keep, you need the diversity to keep the caterpillars going. Um, this is one case study with Japanese stiltgrass. And you say, what difference does it make in the environment? And basically, if you get a really dense stand of stiltgrass, they have found that the wolf spiders benefit the most in these dense carpets and they eat most of the other insects and they also eat young American toads. So where these dense stands exist, they have found that the toad survival rate has plummeted. And then another case in California where they have restored the pipe vine swallowtail there. There was just one person that started um, growing the plants, the California pipe vine and rearing them in a butterfly house, rearing the butterflies on the pipe vine and um, other people have picked up on it in California. And so in the San Francisco area, they're bringing this butterfly back. If you look at Doug Tallamy, he's a researcher that has looked at um, Lepidopteran species on native plants. And you can, you can see that on oaks, they'll support 534 different species. But if you plant a ginkgo, which is a non-native, it supports five. And there's not even good evidence that they feed a lot on the ginkgo. So all these native plants support a lot more caterpillars than some of the non-natives. The Carolina chickadee they found has a much better survival rate with its young if there's at least 70% native plants in the garden because they feed about 6,000 caterpillars to their young um, in, in one nest. They'll eat 6,000 caterpillars. Another reason why is uh, you, it helps with climate change to have native plants and to have trees. We talked about the butterflies and moths being dependent on specific native plants. They co-evolved over a long period of time. These native plants provide shelter for birds and mammals. They provide nectar, pollen, nuts, seeds, fruits at different times of the year. And they generally require fewer chemicals and less fertilizer um, in their care. A lot of them will help you conserve water. And then overall, they're supporting functioning ecosystems that have evolved over a long period of time. Another one that has, we've lost is the monarch butterfly. We're pretty familiar with that, an 80% decline in the last 20 years. Okay, so then the common questions that we have is which plants are native? What native plants work well in the garden? And where can I buy them? So we're gonna try and fly through some of these. Um, you know, native plants are one that ex plants that existed pre-European settlement. Um, some people that like native plants only want to plant the ones that have, have been shown to be found in an echo region or a specific area. But Alan Armitage basically says, you know, even, even using garden improved cultivars that are native will help mainstream gardeners embrace the world of native plants and get more native plants planted out there that will support the ecosystem. So um, you can decide how particular you wanna be about where your native plants come from, whether they have to be your region or the state of Kentucky or maybe um, surrounding states, but anything you do to help with the diversity is, is probably gonna be beneficial. Okay, so these are some of the uh, 
common plants that are non-native, that are not native and can be invasive, you know, try, try not to plant these. There is a great publication out there, Kentucky's Native Alternatives to Invasive Plants, and it kind of lists some of the invasive plants and ones that you can plant instead. Um, all right, so there's different styles of landscaping. And one of the things with native plants, a lot of neighborhoods, they want things to look neat. Um, you know, sometimes you can get away with an informal style. Um, even myself, I have two waterways that I kind of let go and my neighbors are always offering to bush hog them for me, even though I live way out in the country. So sometimes you have to keep a more formal style and need to select plants that, that fit that style. Large drifts can be pretty spectacular and will actually help um, attract the birds and the butterflies. It's easier for them to find where you can plant large drifts. Okay, so you can take all the normal things into consideration when you're doing this. You might need ground cover, seasons of interest, um, specific plants for different wildlife. You might need privacy. And those of us that are plant nerds just want cool plants. We're going to run through starting with ground covers and work up through small trees and we're not going to say too much about large trees. This is a picture I actually took in Lyon County out native. The, um, that's world stone crop and so it is native. You can find it right here and this is a very low growing ground cover that likes shade and it will fill in more if you keep it in your landscape with a bit, with a bit of weeding and can be a really nice ground cover. Okay, Augusta. Um, this is Rose Vervain and has truly been a workforce uh, for me in uh, my West Kentucky native plant garden. And I will say for those of you in other parts of the state, we are in Western Kentucky and our um, zone is mostly listed as 7A. Um, our soil um, is very clay oriented and this bank in particular is clay and rocky, but this plant has been exceptional. It is in full sun. It does spread, so it makes a great ground cover and it blooms for me anyhow uh, from early March all the way through the end of September and into early October. It does uh, attract a good deal of butterflies, especially the swallowtails, as well as hummingbirds. Next slide. Okay, um, I also have some lovely dwarf crested iris that I have um, underplanted among some taller bushes because they make a great um, partial shaded uh, ground cover. They're very sweet. They only grow a maximum of about eight inches and they are deer resistant. Uh, they have a shorter bloom time though, as many irises do, only about four weeks. Next slide. Green and gold. This is another wonderful uh, ground cover uh, for moist areas in particular. It does not really do well in drought. Um, I initially planted about 10 plants and in a year's time, it or a year and a half time, it probably covered 90% of the area. It does um, make a matte, dense um, forming ground cover that does prohibit weeds. And it does bloom. It has a, a splash of blooms in the spring and then blooms intermittently till about October. Next slide. Okay, this is Allegheny Spurge. And this one, it can be used to replace Japanese spurge. It's our native spurge that prefers shaded moist areas. It is rather slow to expand, but it will gradually expand. 
It has flowers that can have a fragrance, even though they're hard to see. And then the foliage is really nice and becomes mottled as it matures. So this is a great replacement for uh, Japanese birds. Okay, moss blocks is one we use all the time. I probably don't need to tell you much about it, but it is a native, deer resistant and attracts butterflies. And then you have the spring blooms in a range of colors that you can plant. I particularly like this one where you've got like some rocks and your, or a rock wall and it kind of gets to spread over those areas. It can do very well. Pennsylvania sedge, there aren't too many people that grow sedges, but this one is like a, a no mow lawn. Um, and, and this is one of the few sedges that can take dry soil. It does like well drained soil. Um, it prefers part shade to full shade. It has weak rhizomes, so it'll spread some, but it's, it's not a super strong spreader and it may self seed a little bit. But you can see in the picture, it's, it's a very attractive sedge and it's a good ground cover for dry shade, forms a, a sod. This is one that you need to plant. It's, it's hard to get it started from seed. So you need to buy plants and put them in. Augusta. Jacob's Ladder is uh, another sweet plant that I have used in my own garden in underplanting, uh, especially in our area because it does pre uh, prefer to have a little bit of shade um, in the hot from the hot sun. It does uh, prefer a well-drained uh, soil. It is deer resistant and works really well under uh, black walnut. Um, next slide. I will comment on that. The lower one is the picture I think from your garden and the upper yeah. one is in the wild about a half mile from our office. So it does occur naturally. Solomon seal is another sweet uh, plant that has just a sweet lily like fragrance to it. Um, and it has blooms in the springs and berries in the fall. What you do need to know about this is um, that it's good for a variety of soil conditions, but when you plant it to get the nicest appearance to it, you should plant it so all the fronds are going in the same direction. Otherwise, it, it it looks a little funky, like um, a cowlick. <laughs> Next slide. St. John's wort um, is a sun-loving uh, peren perennial, uh, and it really can be used in a setting that you feel that you don't have to tightly contain it because it will um, spread some but it's very attractive and has a fairly long uh, bloom time. Next slide. Okay, we threw the, I threw this one in there um, and some of these are, most of these are shade plants and they're probably not gonna be a complete ground cover. They're, they're sort of things you might collect over time and um, they're just neat plants. They do do well if you have a good area for them with shade and, and moist soil. Okay, we're gonna move on to vines. And on some of these first slides, I put the ones that you probably don't wanna plant. And passion flower is one of those, as cool a flower as it is, it's very aggressive in the gardens and can take over and take you a long time to get rid of. Coral honeysuckle, if there's one native vine that you want to plant, this would be the one that I highly suggest. It just has gorgeous flowers. Mine started blooming three weeks ago. Um, I made a trellis for it to help protect it from the deer as well as give it a form to grow upon around a telephone pole. 
It is beautiful in cut flowers. It's long lasting as a cut flower and it blooms again till October and the leaves are very shiny green and it is not invasive. And next slide. I will say it does sometimes get aphids. Sometimes you do have to spray it down for aphids. Okay, this is the Dutchman's pipe vine. I actually have not grown this, but having talked about the California one, I thought it, it, this, it'd be good to put in there. This vine is available from some local nurseries. It used to be planted quite a bit more often, and it does, it is the primary food source for the pipe vine swallowtail. So it might be a neat one to put in your garden. Uh, native wisteria is a good thing to plant instead of the Chinese or Japanese wisterias. It is a fairly large vine that requires regular pruning to keep it size small, but it's a beautiful flower. There are, there are some named cultivars like Amethyst Falls. So if you want to plant a wisteria, um, look for the native wisteria frutescens and, uh, and use that instead. The same thing with American bittersweet. A lot of times we plant the foreign uh, bittersweets, but we have our native plant that does great. Um, gets 15 to 20 feet tall or long. Blooms in May or June and has the showy berries on it. The berries are poisonous to people, but the birds love them. You do need a male and a female plant with these to have berries. They can self-seed and form a thicket. So this one can be a little bit aggressive. The cross vine and trumpet creeper I kept in there, but I think these are ones that you have to have a very particular place to grow because they're very large vines. Um, they can send up root suckers. Um, you do not want to let them grow on your house. These vines have an extreme flammability rating. So um, you want to think about where you want to grow these. They are going to flower best where they have good sun. Um, if you've got a good place for them and can kind of let them naturalize, they are great for hummingbirds. Grasses. Um, as Susan mentioned, this first slide is one that you would might want to think about the application before you plant it. Um, I would say it would be excellent in an area that um, you wanted to completely cover uh, in a planting because it is very uh, invasive. I had planted some of them and I do not recommend it as quote a specimen planting because those seed heads are prolific and it is a very prolific self seeder. Next slide. Pink muley grass. Pink muley grass is really um, a gorgeous grass, especially once it starts blooming. Um, I think it's a front yard worthy grass and I have it in several areas in my front yard and it's a great uh, foundation planting or uh, a backdrop to other native plants. The trick with your pink muley grass is that when you plant it, you'll have much more success with it if it's planted in the spring and not the fall. Next slide. So prairie drop seed is a grass that Beth Wilson, she's a horticulture agent for extension, um, nominated. It's not an aggressive one. It's pretty easy gro to grow and maintain. It has um, really good ornamental value. It is a Missouri Botanical Garden plant of merit. So this is another grass that's not too tall that you can consider using to add variety to your garden. Another one that Beth loved was purple lovegrass, and they do use the red purple inflorescence of this in flower arrangements, but it's low growing, only one or two feet tall, takes average to dry soil and full sun. So this is another grass that's not going to cause you problems and um, come up everywhere. It's, it's tidy and, and pretty. We'll do a good job for you. Little blue stream. First of all, what I'd like to say about little blue stream is 
that the appearance of it uh, can vary uh, from what region you are in. In the variety that I have, um, it does have the silverly blue leaves uh, that do turn a bronze color in the fall. However, mine has not uh, bloomed uh, with the little purple flowers. I also have a big blue strain, which is extremely sim similar, and it'll grow up to eight feet tall. And last fall, I had a deer uh, give birth uh, to babies in my big blue stream. Next slide. The next uh, plant are nodding wild onions. And again, this is something that is worthwhile to uh, plant in the front yard and they are deer resistant. Mine are in full sun and they have an extended bloom time um, they do self-propagate a little bit, but I've taken advantage of that to be able to plant them in other areas of my gardens. They be, um, the bees really do uh, like them a lot, as well as the swallowtail butterflies. Next slide. Coreopsis are also great in the um, native plant garden because there are several varieties, as you can see, that are native. Um, they have long lived blooms uh, and are easy to propagate and have a variety of yellow colors. Next slide. Milkweeds, um, you can see the focus is on the butterfly milkweed. And I personally think that that is stunning in the front yard. The picture on the top is in my garden. Um, it has performed very well for me. It does attract monarch uh, butterflies for me. And I do find the monarch uh, butterfly caterpillars on it. Um, it's somewhat deer resistant, but it is a beautiful, beautiful plant that when I have deadheaded will rebloom. Susan, you wanna talk about the other milkweeds? Uh, we are, rose milkweed is one that we have in the native plant sale this year, or swamp milkweed. It does like moisture areas, but it's less aggressive than the common milkweed. I do have common milkweed in the in my yard. Those two pictures down at below um, are from my yard, but um, I do also have a pasture across the road, and I think I've pretty well seeded the pasture across the road with milkweed, so if you've got farmers around you, it's a, it's a fairly aggressive milkweed, and it's maybe not real great for your neighbors. Um, one, you, you might want to do the rose milkweed or the butterfly milkweed, some of the others that don't spread as much. Uh, Will Overbeck with the Native Plant Society likes the blunt leaved milkweed. And I just put this picture in, I blew it up. It's the same one from the previous page. This is common milkweed, which has a wonderful fragrance. You can't really see the flowers because they hang down. But if you sit there and count the number of insects that are on that one flower, and some of them really go for milkweeds. There are milkweed bugs. But I think there's like at least 30 insects in this on this one plant. You've got a fly, you've got some kind of, uh, looks like maybe a little native pollinator or sweat bee and the beetles. Um, anyway, it's, it's, there's some you can see their antennas sticking up behind. So it is, it is really a plant that um, hosts a lot of different insects. Stokes aster. The Stokes aster is my favorite native uh, aster because it just has such a pretty and a large flower. Um, it is a prolific bloomer and deadheading it um, makes it bloom even more. And it's excellent as a cut flower in arrangements. Next slide. Calico beard tongue. The calico beard tongue is my favorite beard tongue just because it is so very colorful. It has just really um, pretty, pretty flowers. 
And then my favorite thing about it is that uh, at least it, the ones that I have, the leaves do turn that real pretty purple in the fall, which you can see uh, in the picture. And it is very lovely in the front yard. I've had to improve my soil when planting the beard tongue. Next slide. slide. Hori Burnbane is a, um, another purple plant. Um, and this year the picture was taken and it, I didn't have it as supported as well. And so it will tend to spread. Um, it can um, self seed. So if you don't want any additional uh, plants to come up, you can um, remove the flowers. However, it has not been problematic in my garden and it does attract a good deal of butterflies. Next slide. Royal catch fly. This is another beautiful, beautiful uh, flower. Um, you can see it grows fairly tall. Um, it's only um, grows up to three to four feet, but it's stunning in the garden, would be great in the backdrop of the garden. Um, the, and the, the color of the flower is excellent and it does grow well. Next slide. I will say the photo on the left is the fire pink, what we call fire pinks. And that photo came from Land Between the Lakes. So this does grow naturally in our area. That's a little bit smaller plant that blooms a little bit earlier. Um, but that's another in that uh, family that you could, you could plant that's a native. False blue indigo is a very um, pretty plant that blooms um, just in the spring. Uh, in my garden, they do get part sun and it seems to like the um, soil condition because it really does tolerate a very clay and dense soil. Um, it does form like a pod that rattles in the fall. You can uh, trim it if you would like, or you can cut it all the way to the ground in the fall. But um, it does attract, again, the butterflies and is host to many caterpillars. Next slide. I also believe that one's lived something like 50 years. It's a long lived plant. Golden Alexanders. This is another one of my favorite plants um, because it kind of reminds me of Queen Anne's lace, uh, which of course is invasive. And I was looking for something to put in my garden that would resemble that. And this is in the carrot family. And um, it just has a real sweet bloom. It is deer resistant. Um, I've read that it can uh, reseed heavily, but I've not had a problem in it in my garden, and it is uh, in full sun. Next slide. Okay, um, the zigzag goldenrod was another one that Will Beck nominated. It prefers shade, but will tolerate some sun. Gets two to four feet tall and one to three feet wide. It takes an average to a moist soil. Um, there are several types of goldenrods that you can plant, and there's some cultivars like fireworks goldenrod um, that have been selected for gardens. They bloom a little bit better, um, some different uh, characteristics that are, are nice for a garden. Fireworks has got a really nice arching spray. So uh, the blue stemmed uh, goldenrod is very pretty. And then there's that uh, shorter one, the golden baby, that can be 18 to 28 inches tall if you want one that stays a little bit shorter. I do have a common goldenrod in my waterways. It, it gets pretty huge and it's fairly aggressive. So some of these other ones are not quite as aggressive in the garden. They do uh, feed a lot of insects in the fall. This is fall blooming. And for uh, pollinators that are preparing for winter, they can collect a lot of uh, pollen off of these plants and store it for the winter.
Okay, tall phlox. Uh, a lot of people use this in their garden. That's a pretty common plant. And I think most people know how to, how to grow it, um, but it is a native. So that's a good thing to know. It attracts hummingbirds and butterflies. Echinacea, um, again, that's a flower that many people are familiar with. And there are several varieties of native cone flowers. Um, and they do perform very well in our area. And um, they are just excellent feeders for bees and butterflies. Next slide. Did I skip one? No. Nope. I think it's hot. Okay. I, I have the next cone flower, I guess, is on the next slide. So we'll come back to cone flowers. Okay, you want me to do bergamot? Sorry. <laughs> so the bergamots um, are ones that are used in tea commonly. They're called bee balm. Um, they're two to four feet tall and spread two to three feet. Uh, Fistulosa has the purple blooms and Didyma has the scarlet blooms, but both of them are drought tolerant, full sun to part shade, attract bees and hummingbirds and butterflies. Um, they can self seed. Both of them can have powdery mildew, which can be a problem. You can spray with baking soda or potassium carbonate will help with powdery mildew. And uh, deer and the rabbits avoid them both. So it's another good plant for the garden. Okay, hey, this is a, another cone flower, uh, which actually happens to be the Kentucky State flower. This is a picture out of my garden. And these are brown eyed Susans, and it's been a very good performer. Um, it uh, does uh, rebloom if you take the time to deadhead it. And it is a light blooming uh, cone flower, mostly uh, in mid to late August and early September. Next slide. Some people feel the brown eyed Susan is somewhat less aggressive and easier to deal to deal with in the garden than black eyed Susan. Uh, the sunflowers, um, these, these are natives, the ashy sunflower, the western sunflower and the swamp sunflower. And, and also Jerusalem artichoke. Uh, Jerusalem artichoke, people like to dig up and eat the root, slice them. And I, I have not tried them, but apparently they're very tasty from what I, the comments I've seen. So in a meadow type situation or a larger garden, um, these sunflowers would be great to include. Blazing Star. This is a plant that um, I really enjoy too. And I think it's a good plant uh, if you want to surround it with uh, other shorter plants because it is very tall, reaching up to four feet. It is deer resistant and it can be used uh, in the back of a border. It can be uh, used in your front yard landscaping, again, with uh, under planting. Uh, on the uh, one that I have, you can see that the um, clumping around the base of the plant is not near as tall as the uh, spikes are. And it does make a beautiful, long lasting cut flower. And again, it does attract a lot of uh, butterflies. It's one of those plants when people walk by, they say, what's that plant? Next slide. I, I didn't, uh, there's actually two or three different species of native blazing stars. And I didn't um, figure out which one it was, but they do grow in land between the lakes. I've turned my car around and gone back to look and you know they'll be covered in butterflies. Uh, again, this is one of my favorite is Indian pinks. Um, this is just such a sweet, sweet flower. And I have to admit, many of you are familiar with Wynn uh, Dun, uh, Dunwell. Dunwell, thank you, Susan. Um, and he turned me on to this plant. 
and it is just gorgeous. It is sometime difficult to find and it's very difficult to propagate by seed. Um, it does have just these gorgeous red rocket flowers that the hummingbirds just love. I have pictures of hummingbirds feeding on these particular plants. I have uh, planted these in front of my uh, hydrangelas and um, this is a plant that also they say has a shorter uh, bloom time, but I have found that mine have an extended bloom time with deadheading them. And in our area, they like to have a little bit of protection from that afternoon sun. Next slide. They do grow on my road that I live on, you know, alongside the road they, in some partial shade, but I think they can take quite a bit of sun. But they are lovely. They really are a pretty plant in the garden. Joe Pyrie. This is an interesting plant. And I think it's a plant that probably really does well in clusters um, because it looks very dramatic. It does make a beautiful dried cut flower as well as a beautiful flower uh, in an arrangement. And it can tolerate um, a large variety of uh, conditions, uh, which makes it really nice. Again, it would be something that you could put up against a wall or if you wanted to use it as a backdrop uh, in your garden. Next slide. Okay, Marilyn Golden Aster. And this is another Beth Wilson nominee. And if you ask why I did that, I posed a question on Facebook on the Kentucky Native Plant Society Facebook page. What were their favorite uh, native plants in the garden? And so that's why I have some of these uh, where, where I say that somebody nominated them as one of their favorite plants. So Beth Wilson has this in her garden and really likes it. It's a, this grows one to two feet tall blooms August through October. Um, it's, it takes the dry to medium moisture in the soil, full sun to part shade, and attracts butterflies. Aromatic aster is another one that is great in the fall, blooms August through September, stays relatively short, one to three feet. Sometimes these bushes get a little lanky, you know, might not hurt to prune them midsummer and, and shape them up a little bit. Um, but they have fragrant leaves, um, they take dry soils, they're drought tolerant, and they'll attract the birds and butterflies. And I had frost aster just volunteering in my waterways, and the frost aster was also just absolutely covered in pollinators in the fall. I mean, every kind of pollinator there was was on my frost aster. Virginia sweet spire is a lovely bush. Um, I have four of them in my gardens. I have some that are in uh, very moist soil in uh, semi-shade. And then I have some in my front yard that are getting full sun and drier conditions. And they are all performing well. And they make those lovely pendulous uh, white flowers. Um, and it does really well in our clay soil. And I know um, it has a larger height and spread uh, than some people may like, but it is very easy to prune to whatever desired form or size that you would like. And the uh, foliage in the fall does tone that golden red and it's just very pretty. Next slide. There are quite a few cultivars of Sweet Spire too, and some of them are smaller. So um, you can search online and find out more information on those. Um, the chokeberry family, there are black chokeberry and red chokeberry. 
Um, they do have very pretty flowers in the spring, like the one on the bottom pictures. I personally have the red choke berry, and uh, it does have very pretty berries that the birds love in the fall. Um, mine so far have only gotten about four feet tall, but um, they can spread to be three to four feet um, by root suckers, but that's simple to control just by uh, pruning off the uh, suckers if you choose not to have it spread. Next slide. Okay, New Jersey tea uh, is, is a fragrant flower. Uh, it's pretty showy. It makes a good cut flower and it's also drought tolerant. So sometimes in Kentucky, we've had quite a bit of moisture in recent years, but sometimes we do have some pretty big droughts, extended droughts, and this is one that will do well for you. It gets a height of three to four feet and a spread of three to five feet. So it's a smaller shrub and it takes full sun to part shade. Um, it can be a great cover for banks. And then the yellow twigs also are fairly attractive and it's gonna attract hummingbirds and butterflies for you. Barton bush is one that grows wild on the lakes here. It, so it's definitely a native. There are some uh, cultivars that have been selected that have better shape and they can form a nice bush shape. And one of the ones that was just uh, made a Theodore Klein winner this year is called Magical Moonlight. So um, you, can, you can buy some cultivars that maybe are a little neater shape for your garden but it is a magnet for butterflies and other flyers and, and some hummingbirds and that type of thing. It does like a wetter soil, but it can do okay with a dry site. Rose mallow is a really neat flower that's actually native. It looks like it belongs in Hawaii. It does die back to the ground each year, but um, it'll, it comes back. I've never had mine not come back. They bloom July through October with these giant flowers and there's all kinds of cultivars. So you can get shorter, shorter cultivars and taller ones. It is a larval host plant, takes full sun, um, average to wet soil. Um, the Japanese beetles do like them. So I usually have to spray something on them every year for Japanese beetles. And then there are rhododendrons in Kentucky. They're not in Western Kentucky, as far as I know, but um, you can plant them there. They occur in the mountains. The flame azaleas, I have one of those at my house. They're, they're beautiful. Um, there's a pinkster flower, flower azalea. The rhododendrons will do well if you can protect them from full sun and wind, and they can be very spectacular. Viburnums, there are uh, two or three that are native to Kentucky. These are deciduous shrubs and they get a little bit bigger with a spread of a height and spread of six to 10 feet. Can take full sun to part shade. Um, some of them have showy white flowers. They have berries that attract birds. The flowers attract butterflies. Most of them prefer a, a moist loam type of soil that, but they can tolerate a range. Um, and some of them have very good fall color. The uh, maple leaf, Leaf viburnum has great fall color. A lot of these uh, shrubs that like the moister soils do sucker, so you have to do a little bit of sucker control on them. But they make a nice shrub border. Okay, along that same line, we have a uh, spice bush, Lindera benzoin, with a height and spread of six to 12 feet that blooms in March and has a showy, fragrant flower. These, these leaves are also fragrant. That's why it's called spice bush. It has a good yellow fall color that attracts birds and butterflies. And of course, there is a butterfly that, uh, is it the spice bush swallowtail? I think is what it's called that requires this plant. There's the caterpillar down below, kind of an interesting looking caterpillar. Carolina allspice is another shrub that's nice to plant in a shrub border. It has these really unusual flowers that are kind of a brown wine color that are also very fragrant and they can make a good cut flower. Um, so you can prune these up a little bit to shape them if you like. The fruit actually to me looks like a fig. It's kind of an unusual looking fruit. And they have a decent golden yellow fall color. And once again, they, they sucker some, so you have to remove those suckers. 
these are actually a Western Kentucky plant. They're found along the Kentucky and Cumberland rivers. It may be all over the Cumberland River. I, I actually can't say, but um, the, the Kentucky and Cumberland rivers are their uh, native habitat. Nine bark is another interesting one. It's uh, about five to eight feet tall and a spread of four to six feet. Takes full sun to part shade, showy flowers, drooping clusters of red fruit that are really pretty. The bark is actually interesting in the winter, so that pro provides another season of interest. You can rejuvenate these plants by cutting them all the way back to the ground. They are susceptible to fire blight and powdery mildew. And I am not sure if that fire blight is, uh, if they would be a host then if you have fruit trees, that would be something to definitely look into if you have apple trees. Um, this may be one that you don't wanna put if it's hosting fire blight. Elderberry is a neat plant that grows wild all over. Um, it has a height and spread of five to 12 feet and blooms in June to July. And it takes, it'll take full sun, no problem. Um, it likes a medium to wet soil. I have one growing in my waterway, but my waterway is not that wet. Um, it'll attract birds and butterflies. If you want to make elderberry syrup, you're going to have to, I go and cover some of my bundles of berries um, as they're getting ripe so that I have some because I have gone out there and the birds have taken them all. So it makes a wonderful syrup. And that, and Jean Oldham also was another person that said that was one of her favorite plants. Okay. The holly, Augusta, if I'm, I think I'm still doing this, right? Yes. Um, got to turn my page. So we have some native hollies. Possum haw just grows out in the woods. You'll see it in the fall. It's easy to spot because of all the berries on it. It can get 30 feet tall and there are some selected cultivars. And then winterberry is a shorter plant, three to 12 feet. And, and, uh, they both have red, orange to red berries. They tolerate clay soil and, and they have those really neat berries in the fall that are pretty. Um, there's some that are only, only get two or three feet tall. So um, you, can, you can look for selections for your garden. Winter Sprite, I think is a smaller one. Hazelnut is just an interesting plant bush. So it gets 10 to 16 feet tall with a spread of 8 to 13 feet. It can also root sucker, but look at those um, seeds, how they form those. Uh, I don't know if they're called a pod. I'm not sure what they call those flower uh, pods and seeds, but it's really cool. I spotted one in LBL last fall. I was like, what is that? And so they do occur naturally around here and people can eat the seeds as well as animals. A pretty neat plant. Witch hazel is another one that's kind of unusual. The, the leaves are kind of coarse on them. It's not the necessarily the prettiest leaf, but the main reason you grow them is because they have this really cool flower that blooms October through December. And there are also crosses that are non-native. They're the native cross with a non-native that will bloom even in the early winter, um, like January, February. They can sucker a little bit and, and you may need to remove suckers, but um, I think one of the, to me, one of the main interests is just the fall blooming flowers. American holly is a, is a broadleaf evergreen holly that is native to the United States. It can get 15 to 30 feet tall with a spread of 10 to 20 feet. These leaves do have the spiny teeth and this is kind of the Christmas holly where everybody cuts it in the winter and brings it in to decorate the house with the pretty red berries on it. The birds eat these berries in late winter after they fermented. And we had, there was one uh, next, am I running out of time? Check my time. I tell a story. My neighbor had a great big one and, and in February the birds ate all the berries and they said, those birds are having a party. It sounds like they're drunk. And I said, well, they may be, those, those berries have fermented. <laughs> so. Flowering dogwood in spite of its problems with powdery mildew and anthracnose, we all love it. Um, it's best to grow it in partial shade and to look for cultivars that have some disease resistance. Appalachian Spring is one that has a pretty high resistance to both powdery mildew and anthracnose. But um, plant it in at least partial shade and try and get a variety that has disease resistance. Eastern Redbud, 
it's blooming everywhere right now and you have a wide variety of uh, cultivars to choose from um, rising sun purple uh, forest pansy uh, there's a gold one there's one that's got red in it um, that's pretty cool so these are neat trees that grow easily i did have uh, a rising sun that got killed by ambrosia beetle last year so every once in a while they run into a problem but basically a really neat one in the Leaf cutter bees really like them. They'll cut circles out of the leaves and use them. Um, so that, I think they're just a neat tree. Service berry is a little bit harder to find, um, but they bloom white at the same time as Bradford pear. So if you want to plant a Bradford pear, maybe you'd consider planting a service berry. The birds love the fruit and they are native. Um, really neat plant. White fringe tree, I have one of these in my yards and they are cool. You do need a sep they are separate male and female. So to have berries on them, you need a male and female tree. The problem with this one is it will be attacked by the emerald ash borer. So actually right now, I'd say I can't recommend planting it because um, you would have to protect it from the emerald ash borer to keep it alive, unfortunately. Red buckeye, we have about 14 of these. We're gonna sell in the native plant sale this month. This is a small tree, 12 to 15 feet tall, has the showy red flowers that the hummingbirds love. It can take full sun to part shade and medium water. The seeds are toxic to people, but I think the deer can eat them and it's not a problem for them. And then of course, everybody knows pawpaw. This is a really uh, popular one. Did you have this one? So this one gets 15 to 30 feet tall, has large edible fruit, um, it's really a tropical plant. The farthest north that you get these kind of uh, in the mango family tropical plant. Um, it can have a banana, pineapple flavor. It can be kind of like a custard. Um, in the in the shade, it gets uh, a real open kind of canopy. But if you grow it in full sun, it'll have a dense canopy. It has a dark wine purple flower that's kind of neat to look at. And then this picture in the lower left is one I took this past fall in LBL. They will spread by root suckers. And so you'll have, um, you'll have groves of them coming up. But it, a lot of years, they have a very pretty fall leaf color that's a little bit late. Um, they are the host of the zebra swallowtail caterpillar. And it says water medium to wet, but I see them growing on the hillsides all around LBL, so they're not too particular. I will say that one thing that's important about the pawpaw is that if you want to produce fruit, you should have a male and a female plant. Um, and you can order them that way from a native plant nursery. And conversely, that conversely, if you don't want to have fruit, you just have one. You don't want to deal with it. Right. Correct. Okay, we are really not going to talk about big trees. There are so many and uh, that are good. The oaks are wonderful caterpillar hosts. Black gum is a neat, a neat one. It has berries that the birds love to eat and it has great fall color. But um, we're not going to do the, tr the larger trees today. I will say there are a couple more ground covers that I didn't really put in. I added this late. Um, blue violet. Uh, the blue violet has this neat little thing. It has this hidden flower. So after it has the flowers that you see in the picture, it also can make these hidden flowers that self-pollinate. And that's one reason it spreads so much. So we don't usually recommend planting violets because they do spread everywhere. So if you plant them or if they come up and you let them go, you have to be prepared. You have to want that. And the same thing with wild strawberry. Both Augusta and I have had wild strawberry. I still have mine. She took hers out. It's a fairly aggressive spreader. I think mine looks like it needs a little fertilizer. That was, I just took that the other, yesterday. And um, so it's, it's a little bit weak looking there, but um, any, you wanna say anything about the wild strawberry, Augusta? I found it to be invasive for what I wanted in my garden. Right, so if you have a place you wanna let it go, then it will spread. There are a lot of seed and plant sources. One of the great places to find the nurseries for Kentucky native plants is on the Native Plant Society webpage. They have a listing of all the Kentucky uh, native plant nurseries. 
there is a Missouri Wildflowers Nursery that has a neat catalog also. Um, and the local stores are carrying more and more natives. And if people keep asking for them, I think they'll <coughs> continue to carry more. Excuse me. Um, I might also add when you go to a regular nursery, please make sure that you read your tags because sometimes you'll be looking at a cultivar of a native plant. So it just depends if you want to be a purist or not. We have lost a lot of tree species, different plants under attack from invasive things. So it, it's good to plant for diversity. The forestry department is working on gene silencing and things to try and help some of our species survive. Um, if I've been cut off, it, no, there it goes. Okay, there are a couple of ladies there that are doing a lot to try and help with the invasive species and helping our helping species survive. This is a listing of several great resources. I, this I, is not on your slide set. <clears throat> there are tree, since we're not doing trees, the Hort Department has a whole series of native trees of Kentucky. And also the Forestry Department has a series of co on con uh, common Kentucky trees. So there's lots of resources you can look to for more information. And this and is that's Odessa picture of a flower arrangement I've done with mostly native flowers. Um, what's outstanding in that, of course, are the asters and the uh, honeysuckle and the grasses and, and a variety of other uh, coreopsis and so forth. Um, and I'm able to do that all bloom season long. And again, that's one of my passions is to use my natives in flower arranging. 